Following World War II, proponents continue to press for the more capable, large, rigid airship. Goodyear Aircraft had not given up on its dream of a passenger carrying luxury liner capable of flying the vast Pacific in quiet, stable luxury, once the government paid for the engineering. But rigid airships disappeared from Navy planning by January of 1947. Faced with shrinking budgets, senior officers remained committed to the airship as a capable anti-submarine system as a competition for its next generation was announced. Douglas Aircraft challenged Goodyear as the sole builder of airships with a radical new design featuring internal engines. Goodyear favored a longer, three-part, double-deck car favored by many pilots. The Bureau of Aeronautics favored the shorter, double-deck car. Of course, the Bureau went out and a compromise of the two designs was ordered from the only capable contractor, Goodyear, in 1948. The new ZPN-1 was rolled out in June 1951. Displacing 875,000 cubic feet, the NAN-1 had a useful lift of six tons. It featured a twin-centered ballonet that reacted to altitude chains without affecting trim. Its twin 700 horsepower engines could drive either propeller or drive both through tandem gearboxes. N1 was the first airship to have internal engines since the USS Macon in 1935. Tricycle landing gear prevented its long propellers from striking the ground. The N1 featured distinctive X pattern fins with control surfaces called rudivators. Each would work partly as an elevator and partly as a rudder. The promising new airship was put to a variety of tests. To prove the concept of towed acoustical minesweeping, N1 flew out of NEF Weeksville and pulled a 65-foot landing craft around Albemarle Sound with the boat's engines running backwards. The Naval Research Lab conceived of a method of tracking nuclear submarines by the trail of heat the reactor would leave in its wake. Project Clinker first mounted a 100-inch radiometer on M4, then tested it flying from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. During March and April of 1956, ZP-1 teams were challenged by crosswinds on the single runway and small field area but repeatedly flew the missions on moonless nights when the sensitive infrared cameras worked best finding submarines. An improved version of the giant heat-seeking radiometer was mounted on the N1 for more testing as Project Clinker continued. N1 paved the way for the production model to possess even greater performance. The first NAN off the assembly line, now designated ZPG-2, was delivered to Lakehurst in March 1953. Displacing nearly one million cubic feet, the ZPG-2 was the most persistent and capable anti-submarine aircraft yet built. Its sophisticated avionics suite featured the powerful new APS-20 search radar integrated with electronic countermeasure and communications equipment. It could carry depth charges and two homing torpedoes. The two-story, 83-foot-long car contained spacious working areas for the crew to coordinate sensor data on a plotting board. The internal engines were accessible in the midship compartment. ZP squadrons transitioned from the smaller ZSG-4 and ZS-2G ships to the ZPGs with operational training. 
NADU, the Naval Air Development Unit, received its first ZPG-2 and set up shop at the Naval Air Station South Weymouth, Massachusetts. Almost twice the size of any K-ship, the ZPG-2 also required more than twice the men for a landing party using the time-honored technique of grabbing the bow line. To reduce the size of the ground crews needed to wrestle the big ships around the mat, mechanical ground handling winch tractors called mules were developed. Upon landing, only one man was needed to grab each yaw line and run it over to the winch on each mule. As the pilot applied reverse thrust, the mules backed away to hold the ship's bow in position. Using four-wheel steering, the mule driver could keep in step with the airship's movements. A heavy tractor was used to tow the mooring mast close to the bow. The ship's nose line was connected to the mast retracting winch line. All units moved under the command of the ground handling officer until the mooring cone was safely locked in the mast cup. Moving the giants in and out of the hangars required precise teamwork and good communications. Mules handling the aft ropes kept extreme winds from slamming the tail against the doors. High winds managed to overcome this system only one time in its history. Mission planning, unlike short duration airplanes, had to encompass 60 hours or more. Truck scales were used to weigh off the airship in the hangar. Then going back on the mast started the undocking. Once on the landing mat and fueled up as much as 6,000 pounds heavy, the command pilot signal for unmasting would trigger the quick retreat of the mooring mast. Then, as the airship began its takeoff run, one man in each yaw rope would pull a trip line to release the bow from the mules. With its twin internal engines, each driving one or both propellers through a gearbox, the ZPG-2 could extend its time on station by conserving fuel. Using its sophisticated radar and anti-submarine towed sonar and other sensors, the ZPG-2 was more than a match for any conventional submarine. The ZPG-2 airship could carry a half dozen man relief crew with enough fuel and supplies to operate several days on station. The second deck, accessible from the main deck, featured a galley and dinette where one member of the crew would double as a cook and the off watch could even gaze out windows. The relief crew could get some sack time in the bunks located in the quiet area above the flight deck. Too large for a carrier landing, the ZPG-2 could refuel and rearm from a flat top, but also refuel from oilers like other flight units. But war games with U.S. submarines were conducted with decreasing frequency. One mission turned into a 44-hour struggle to return to Stormy Lakers. Pilots and crews sought to wring more performance from this newest patrol ship. On the 17th of May, 1954, Captain Henry Epps and his crew of 14 lifted off from Lakers with almost 16,000 pounds of fuel on board. Flying out into the Atlantic, they passed over Bermuda, then Puerto Rico, and when they finally landed at Key West, Florida on the 25th, they had flown 200 hours traveling over 3,000 miles without taking on fuel or supplies. The entire crew received the Air Medal, and Captain Epps received the Distinguished Flying Cross. Epps also received the Harmon Trophy from Vice President Richard M. Nixon at a White House ceremony. May I say also that in learning of this award that I 
was uh, very interested to note the difference between an aeronaut and an aviator. <laughs> you are in the light of an air. Congratulations to a Navy aeronaut for your splendid work. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. The ZPG-2's aft station was also equipped with a sophisticated winch. Another bag could be used to winch aboard seawater to replace the disappearing fuel tonnage. Dipping the bag had to be done with care, lest it be torn off the cable. During one extended mission, one crewman caught a fair-sized fish in the sea bag. The Cold War took on a new meaning as attention turned to the frozen north. The nuclear submarine USS Nautilus was being readied for the first ever trip deep under the Arctic ice. The boat would cross the top of the world underwater. Obviously, anti-submarine measures would someday be necessary north of the Arctic Circle. As part of the International Geophysical Year, the Naval Air Development Unit undertook an extraordinary mission. A blimp would fly above the Canadian Arctic Circle for the first time since the Italian ship Norgay had flown across the top of the world in 1926. Senior officer aboard was Captain H.B. Van Gorder. The mission, under Command Pilot Lieutenant Commander Henry Collins, was delayed by less than appropriate areological conditions, but got underway from South Weymouth, Massachusetts on the 27th of July, 1958. The ZPG-2, number 719, was given the appropriate nickname, the Snow Goose. Unusually hot weather dictated a layover in Akron, but the next refueling was north of Lake Superior as Snow Goose landed at Fort Churchill, Manitoba on the Hudson Bay on the 4th of August. An advanced Navy team in a NADU Super Constellation airplane had prepared a mooring mast amidst a gravel runway. The crew, including Royal Canadian Air Force Liaison Wing Commander Keith Greenaway, then pushed further north than any previous Navy airship. Polar bears were sighted during the long daylight hours. Crossing the Arctic Circle, the 719 pressed on to Resolute Bay. The Nadu Kani crew had also set up a mooring mast at the Royal Canadian Air Force Base on Cornwallis Island using explosives to make the foundation in the hardened permafrost. The final northward leg took Snow Goose just 400 miles from the pole. Fog closed in, so radar was used to find a scientific station drifting on the ice. The airshipman dropped mail to the isolated scientists. Equipment flown along for them was not dropped since it could have hit the shelters or even the people below. The fog was so dense the scientists could only hear the ZPG-2's engines. They could not see the airship. A second attempt was out of the question when the Resolute Base runways turned to mud. Stopping only long enough to refuel, the 719 flew 1,000 miles back to Churchill and then southeast back home to South Weymouth, arriving on August 12th. A total distance of 6,200 miles had been flown. Sadly, there was little recognition for the achievement. A second mission to the Arctic was quietly canceled. Senior officers were hardly focused on a way to integrate the powerful anti-submarine airship into the fleet. A common complaint was the perception that airships could not fight submarines in bad weather. In February 1958, the winter was so severe a ZPG-2 inside Lakehurst Hangar 5 was deflated when fire hose water sprayed to remove snow froze solid. A great deal of experience was gained during Project Lincoln in which every effort was made to operate in snow and icing conditions. 
special in instrumentation, radios, radars, and even closed circuit television were put aboard to monitor performance. It was found that snow would not accumulate significantly at speeds above 40 knots. Ice would only accumulate to about 5% of the airship's gross weight, and engineering enhancements were suggested to mitigate its effects. President Eisenhower awarded the Harmon Trophy to Commander Charles Mills for his work on Project Lincoln. The ultimate endurance demonstration began at South Weymouth, Massachusetts on March 4, 1957. The chosen ZPG-2 ship had been nicknamed the Snowbird, and it was still decorated with the bright orange recognition marks left over from the icy flights of Project Lincoln. Command pilot Jack Hunt and his NATO crew took the ZPG-2 number 561 out over the Atlantic. Advanced mission planning arranged for a Super Connie to fly ahead and land at various points along the way. The airplane carried the stick mass that could be easily erected if any emergency landing was necessary. First checkpoint was the Azores, where World War II airships had stopped to refuel on their trips to Africa years earlier. 561 then passed by the southern tip of Portugal, overflew the Canary Islands and the Verde Islands before reaching Africa. Flying over Casablanca, the 561 was the only Navy airship to pass French Morocco since World War II. Turning back across the Atlantic, the 561 toured the Caribbean and overflew Puerto Rico. When the airship was spotted over Key West, Florida on the 15th of March, it still possessed sufficient fuel to fly another day but Admiral William F. Halsey was waiting to award the crew. When she finally landed, the 561 had flown over 264 hours. That's the 11 days without refueling, a combined time distance record that stands to this day. Jack Hunt was awarded the Harmon Trophy by President Eisenhower at the White House. Meanwhile, Scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute had discovered deep channels carrying sound in the ocean. Three sound fixing and ranging stations were constructed. Later, the more elaborate sound surveillance system carpeted the ocean floor with fixed hydrophone arrays. Airships were employed to help calibrate the system flying hundreds of miles out to sea to identify contacts and telling the listeners what they were hearing. The crewmen did not realize they were helping work the airships out of a job. During the calibration, an exercise was constructed for February and March of 1960. It was aptly titled Operation Whole Gale. In some of the worst wind and snowstorms ever recorded, just six ZPG-2 airships from ZP-1 and ZP-3 flew a respectable 1,644 hours. One crew, under command pilot Lieutenant Lundy Moore, made a 96-hour flight and tracked one nuke boat for 16 hours. They remained on anti-submarine station for 93 hours, a record that stands to this day. In spite of this record endurance, unequaled on-station mission times and good safety record, senior naval officers would not fully integrate Boeing aircraft into the fleet. Little note was made of maintenance records which showed identical electronic systems aboard General Blimps were more reliable than aboard rougher airplanes. Anti-submarine airship operations were winding down when a ZPG-2 delivered the last bags of mail carried on a Navy airship. 
airship operations with aircraft carrier support ended in 1957. Shrinking budgets insisted that if it did not fit on a carrier, it had no place in the Navy. Elsewhere, seaplanes were eliminated and a great effort was made to get rid of the maritime patrol airplane. ZP-1, ZP-4, and ZX-11 were all decommissioned in June 1957. Naval Air Facility Weeksville was decommissioned and the headquarters of Fleet Airship Wing 1 was moved back home to Lakers. Even the training command at Glencoe was shut down in 1959 after about 400 pilots had been qualified in LTA. Forced cross-training and heavier than air came as a series of damaging accidents gutted the once proud blimp force. Airships would yet be called upon for a new, entirely different mission.